Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It's Thursday, February 25th, 2010, and I'm joined by Mike Lawrence, the Executive Director of Q, and our special guest, Susan Patrick, today. So, Mike, I think you moved our slides forward, or someone did, but I'm going to go back and queue us up. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Hello. Sure, glad to have you here today. Uh, have a couple of items of business. If you're coming to Q, or if you're not, we hope that you'll go to QUnplugged.com. We're going to have a series of, of sessions at Q. Uh, there are still some spaces available. These are sessions you can sign up where you can present at Q if you're there physically, or you can watch through Illuminate some sessions that will be held at Q. This is very fun, and we hope that you'll uh, come join us, whether you're at Q or not. Uh, futureofeducation.com is sponsored by my employer, Illuminate, and especially the Learn Central program, which is my paid job. Please come visit learncentral.org and find out how we're trying to help educators with a free educational network that has Illuminate baked in. Lots of fun services, including uh, the ability to host a free public webinar if you're interested in doing that. Coming up on conversations.net and futureofeducation.com, uh, after the week off, we'll all be at COSIN and Q. Uh, Bernard Robbins starts a Merlot series for us. Then the authors of Total Recall, uh, Sharon Peters on Teachers Without Borders. On the 16th, we start an open source series with NSBA's uh, T plus L. Uh, Benoit St. Andre will start with a guide for the school technology leadership team. On March 17th, another series starts. It's a book on education for the digital world, so look for announcements about that. On March 17th, the 21st Century Skill Authors. March 18th, A View from the Commercial Side, Kathy Davidson on the 23rd. The Social Network Classroom on the 24th. Lots more fun, including Sir Ken Robinson on the 30th of March. You can look at the schedule, uh, particularly at futureofeducation.com. Hope you'll join us for some of these. If you've missed any shows, all of the archive shows are at the Future of Education, futureofeducation.com, including last week, uh, Clay Shirky and Dan Pink, which was lots of fun. So please do look those up there in um, a full Illuminate format for recording or uh, MP3 files, and also the podcast RSS streams are there. If this is your first time in Illuminate, we do want you to know this is an interactive environment. We hope you'll participate actively. You have a couple of ways of doing that. At the bottom of the participant window, you'll see some emoticons. You can smile. You can clap. You can let Susan know you're confused. You can use thumbs down, which would only be for me and not for Susan, of course. Um, the larger icon to the left of those emoticons is a hand with an up arrow, and that's how you would raise your hand later to let us know you'd like to take the microphone. Then we actually give you the mic capability, and you turn your mic on to speak. Uh, you have the chat window. Uh, you have an ability to send a private chat to someone else in that window, but do know that Mike, Susan, and I see all of those. There's nothing fully private because we're moderators. We do see the private chat. And um, I'm going to take you right now to a map and let you participate by telling us where you're listening from. Look for the little wand and the red star with the red star at the end on the left of the map, and then click on that and click on the map. And feel free to give a shout out in the chat to let us know where you're listening from. Maybe the temperature or the weather, which is pretty variable these days. Anxious to hear who's. Um, in Europe and Asia there, in the Middle East. Oh, Margaret from Ireland, thank you for being here. So most of you don't know this. You would not know this, but Hargadon is an Irish name. And I actually saw Steve Hardiman in here. And Steve, you may not know this, but Hardiman and Hargadon actually come from the same Gaelic name, or so I'm told. Hey, Lima, Peru. Lots of fun. OK, and I'm now going to move us forward. Um, Mike, you have a couple of slides. Do you want to move us to those slides first? 
Um, certainly, if, if there's a moment I just want to share because it relates directly to uh, something that Susan will be doing at the Q conference next year. And hello to everybody uh, across the globe. It's always exciting to be uh, a participant. Um, let me go ahead and, and move us forward. We've got uh, a really exciting announcement that I want to make here. It seems appropriate that uh, Illuminate is going to be illuminating some sessions at the Q conference uh, next week in Palm Springs. So in addition to what Steve already mentioned at the Q Unplugged area, we have uh, what looks to be eight or nine sessions. We've yet to finalize the ninth one that will be illuminated um, uh, next week, and specifically Friday, Saturday, March uh, 5th and 6th. Uh, so more details will be posted shortly, very shortly, at Q.org and at 2010.Q.org, which is our Q guide. Uh, and one of those sessions is going to be the Digital Textbook Summit. And uh, Susan was kind enough to uh, agree to moderate a panel of experts to talk about the Digital Textbook Initiative in California, what it means for education in California and abroad. And I'm really particularly excited about that. That will be one of the sessions that we illuminate. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to seeing some active engagement uh, during that uh, session. And uh, the Q guide I mentioned, I also want to point this out. It is a, a new thing. We're, we're, we're testing out a new system this year. It's powered by sketch.org. Everything runs on top of Google Docs. It's a fairly useful tool. We've done guides in the past, but this one seems to take, take it uh, above and beyond what we've ever done before. So take a crack at it. It's uh, free to visit. You can go and use it. And in fact, I will be adding the live Illuminate links into the sessions that will be illuminated, including the, the Q Unplugged session, Steve. I haven't yet to tell you that, but we're going to put those in um, probably Monday once they get closer to the event, maybe Tuesday. Uh, so just those are some of the big things I wanted to share, make sure folks were aware of uh, how Illuminate uh, is going to be utilized at the conference and how folks who can't make it to Palm Springs as much as you'd like to in March, um, uh, you could still participate and uh, get something from the event. Uh, everything I've just described is free, so I uh, hope you guys can uh, participate. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Mike. Hey, can I do something very quickly here? I'd like to show people what that site looks like, your guide site. So I'm going to do a desktop sure. here, and you're going to see in just a second coming up on your screen. Mike, I think this is really cool. It's I, built I on top so of Google Docs. It runs off of Google Docs. They built on top of the API, and then it feeds into this system that we can help customize. So I gave them the graphic for the top, and then I dump in everything else in Google Docs. I hit update, and boom, it updates. It's. I thought it was slick, but I'm, I'm pleased to hear that others think so too. I, I, I figure out, you know, I'm just geeky enough to enjoy this sort of thing. Uh, but uh, I think a lot of people have found value in it because you can create a few a free account. You can build your own schedule. You can download it to your calendar, whether that be iCal or, or Outlook or whatever. You can print it. Then wh where I think it really goes crazy is you can log in through Twitter or Facebook or both, and then it shows you everybody who you're friends with on those networks, their schedules. If they've allowed that to happen, it's up to them to, to, to share it. But if they have shared it, then you could say, oh, Steve Harganon, he's going to be at the same session I'm going to. I should sit next to him, or I should maybe go to a different one so that we can talk about it. So it's, it's going to create, I think, a whole new layer of interaction for the conference that we've never truly experienced. And of course, this is all viewable and functional on your mobile device as well. So uh, you could search by presenter. You could search by room. So if you just typed in Patrick, for instance, uh, you could actually pull up all the sessions that Susan's leading at the conference and, uh, and click on it, and it adds it to your schedule if you're logged in. And I, super I have fast. I have to say I was really impressed. You, you have the different uh, types of events that are taking place. And then once you've selected them, so I'm going to say I'm going to go see Susan on this day at this time, then I can go to my schedule and I actually see my schedule. I didn't realize I'd logged in through Twitter, but I didn't realize that was actually going to let me see my friends. Very cool. Yeah, if you go over to, uh, I think it's attendees, it shows you um, friends schedule. So if you, if you see that, that's everybody who's coming. But if you do the drop down and go to friends schedule uh, at the top, under There's attendees. The drop down. Okay, attendees, sorry. Slow, I'm slow on tests. <laughs> <laughs> so here, now we can see um, that Steve has three friends. Uh, two of them are me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this uh, is embarrassing. We've got to find you some more friends, Steve. But in any case, these are the, these are the schedules of Brian Bridges, and then I'm that little three-year-old, and then Q is the official Q Twitter account. So uh, you can now see who's going where. Very fun, Mike. Really glad that you've uh, done that. We'll look forward to watching how that evolves.
Okay, so that having been said, uh, that was enjoyable, but we are going to move on to our guest speaker. Susan, thanks so much for agreeing to come on again. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but um, we've been doing a series with InnoSight and Michael Horn, and then I did uh, a couple of sessions with the authors of Virtual Schooling, and then yesterday did a session with Online Education for Dummies. This is clearly becoming a hot topic that you were well aware of years ago. So I hope that you'll give us a sense of your perspective today. Sure. Thank you, Steve. As I have been thinking about this topic for a number of years, um, and many of you may not know that I had a background in higher ed running a distance learning campus that got me really interested in how these new delivery models are really opening up opportunities for all, all different kinds of people to come back into the education system to re-energize. But when we think about online learning, um, think about it with, with kind of one thing in mind. And, and I like to say, everything I ever learned about online learning, I learned online, which is pretty much a true statement. Um, this is a time uh, that the future of education is changing very rapidly. And in the context of the Winter Olympics that are happening in Vancouver, we're actually watching the, the future of education in front of us. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but many of the athletes participating from the United States are uh, students um, in virtual schools. Apollo Ono, for one, the speed skater is a virtual school student that has allowed him to pursue his uh, Olympic hopes and dreams. So um, thanks, Steve, and thanks, Mike. I am in the uh, Virginia area now. It is very cold and looking forward to coming out to Palm Springs next week for Q. Well, let's go ahead and get started. I want to share um, with some folks that aren't familiar with the International Association for K-12 Online Learning. We're a nonprofit organization. Uh, Q is one of our affiliates, the first affiliate organization. We're a membership-based uh, association for people interested in online learning in uh, K-12 schools. We have members that are school districts, that are states, that are higher ed institutions, and um, a whole range of think tanks and other folks like the, the people that Steve's been talking to. And one of the things that people always ask us about is uh, quality and quality standards in online learning. Um, for those of you, just as an introduction, we have uh, national quality standards for online programs that we've just released, national quality standards for online teaching, and national quality standards for online courses. I wanted to highlight some new reports that have come out that I think is uh, uh, that are really interesting for those of you around the country and around the globe. And one is um, the future of instructional materials and specifically the workshop and the session that I'm leading at the Q conference on Saturday morning is about digital textbooks. Um, very interesting report from NASB is the National Association of State Boards of Education based in, in the Washington, D.C. area. But there was a meeting around rethinking the state role in uh, this is beyond textbook adoption and new opportunities with digital curriculum, with open educational resources for innovation and cost savings. It's just a 10-page report, very interesting, uh, especially in light with those of you in California, um, the new initiatives that you have. There, there is a lot um, happening in this area. A new report this month from Governor Bob Wise and, and Steve, he may be somebody that you want to um, bring in on the Future of Education series called The Online Learning Imperative, the Solution to the Three Looming Crises in Education, lays out a very compelling uh, case and it's a wonderful advocacy report on the three looming crises for the United States and for all countries, global competitiveness, the teacher shortages that are happening across the U.S. but also worldwide, and also the economic downturn. And it gives um, some very good data on the cost savings that have been realized in several case studies in online learning. This report is on the Alliance for Excellence. 
uh, website. It's also available uh, and linked on the inacles.org website. Uh, again, Michael Horn, uh, who has been an expert in this program from Intersight Institute, has published a number of case studies that look at online and blended learning, and uh, those are available for free download as well. And from our organization, we have these uh, reports that are available for download. It's a whole promising practices series on online learning. And many people gra grapple with issues of managing and administering online learning programs for quality and accountability. Uh, the legislative and policy frameworks, the funding frameworks for online learning, and really I'm going to talk more about this. Blended learning and the convergence of face-to-face -face and online learning really changing the way that not only classrooms work, um, but the way time, resources, and, and um, learning can happen throughout the day. Using online learning for credit recovery is a field that has just dramatically changed in the last three to five years with new models of performance-based, mastery, and competency-based credit recovery and uh, also acceleration for at-risk and other students who are um, falling behind. Uh, parents' guide and issues about socialization in online programs are all uh, useful. So what are some trends? These are some uh, broad trends that we see happening across the United States, but also um, what's happening uh, internationally, too. This morning, I did a, a webinar using Illuminate for a group in Ontario. In Canada, in Ontario and in British Columbia, they are really moving forward in the work that they're doing. They develop um, online courses across the province for use in all schools. They deliver uh, and develop two formats of those courses, one that can be offered in a virtual environment and another that can be modularized and used for blended learning. So these new school models that are starting to happen all over the country and all over the world, uh, there's a huge focus from the um, uh, president and from the U.S. Department of Education in turning around the nation's lowest performing schools, new models of blended learning that can help uh, support students and have new student-centered models are coming into play there with online and blended learning. Credit recovery, new models of online credit recovery. The course options, the expanding course options in schools is the number one driver for students uh, and to be taking and enrolling in online courses, changing the distribution. That is, where there are shortages of highly qualified teachers, online uh, learning and virtual learning is helping to meet those needs. Some really interesting models for dual enrollment, high school students that are um, college bound are now starting to take classes within their high school online offered by community colleges or colleges where they are starting to earn college credit without uh, leaving the building. College readiness and career readiness is a huge focus as well as new models of competency-based learning. Uh, we're seeing that, we've seen it across Alaska, Chugach School District, but also in Colorado in the Denver area in Adams 50 completely rethinking the classroom in blended learning models that allow for student-centered uh, competency-based uh, mastery approaches. Very interesting. So in those big trends, I've got kind of three, three um, slides here about blended learning. This is really the future of where this is going. And blended learning is about using online tools, delivery models in the classroom. But people think of this sometimes as, as well. Um, this is from an a EDUCAUSE briefing. Not just a temporal construct, but rather this is a fundamental redesign of the instructional model. And it's a shift from lecture to student-centered instruction. The interactions between student and instructor should not be diminished, but actually increase. You see increased dialogue and discussions from student to student, student to content, and also student to outside resources. 
We see new models of adaptive and integrated formative and summative assessment mechanisms for students and instructors. So these are new models that are starting to be implemented um, quite successfully. And here's another way of looking at blended and hybrid approaches. It, it, I love this quote. It, when you're combining the face-to-face -face with the fully online components, it should optimize both environments in ways that are impossible in other formats. So you're looking at using the digital content curriculum not to just deliver instruction the way we always have, but you're running a new delivery model using a learning management system or Web 2.0 tools. Uh, using uh, tools like Illuminate, online assessments, data systems, artificial intelligence, and new simulations. So there's really a shift in this instructional model and training. In a traditional classroom with, say, 25 students, it's hard for one instructor to individualize and personalize instruction for all 25 students. This allows students to move forward and accelerate, or if they're having a difficult time, and they're struggling on a particular lesson, teacher can apply more direct student support and differentiate that instruction. We'll see students that are very successful or more self-directed be able to accelerate and move forward, but at times they fall back in that red part of the year or two and need direct help so that that student support is truly around uh, meeting the student's needs. So the last big idea here, and we do have a promising practices around blended learning, that there, uh, what we're finding is, uh, is a classic innovation model. Lots of different innovative models of blended learning come up. There's no single type of blended education. Some schools are saying, well, you can take five of your classes face-to-face -face and one of your classes online and readjust your schedule, calling that blended. Other programs are, are um, doing more of what we talked about and fundamentally redesigning the way time and resources and content and instruction happens in the classroom. But the key point is that it needs to stay student-centered. Um, there are new methods around instruction, even content development and professional development. And we're seeing new platforms come into the classroom that will have significant web components and more communication and interaction. The policies that need to be adjusted really in districts and in states are moving away from cracking down on the Carnegie unit for seat time and looking at competency-based pathways. And another huge trend that we're seeing is online and blended learning as a solution for academic continuity or continuity of learning. And we do have uh, a section of our website and a link to the resources that uh, Steve has put together on continuity of learning for the H1N1. So the big idea here, and this takes me back to my uh, graduate school days, if you think back when Nicholas Negroponte was writing his columns in Wired Magazine, um, this focus on becoming digital, being digital, at that time, he, uh, back in the early 90s, was saying, uh, suddenly the age of true personalization is now upon us. Well, this is nearly uh, 20, 20 years later, and we're certainly seeing that in every aspect of our life. Uh, this is from uh, Disrupting Class, Michael Horn and Clayton Christensen. It's showing that this is the innovation S-curve. Uh, what we're seeing here is that red line, the trajectory that is happening with online and blended learning. It is following that S-curve of innovation and moving very quickly into our schools and classrooms. Not evenly, but quickly in terms of where it is being adopted, it is showing that it is successful and um, that it is moving faster and faster. So uh, number one, the reason that most school districts started taking and adopting online courses is to expand options. Number two, it's growing very rapidly. And um, it's growing 30% annually in some states, 50 to 100%. And um, in other cases, you're seeing it move um, even faster, but it really depends on what choices are available, where a student can access a state virtual school, or if the district has its own programs. Uh, I see a question here on what school districts are early adopters 
of blended learning and hybrid learning. Um, in that blended learning promises track practices book, there is a whole um, list of case studies showing the early adopters. But a few just to highlight are um, Chicago. Um, the Chicago Public Schools has two interesting models. One is the Chicago Virtual Academy and the other is the Voice Academy, which is a virtual opportunities in a school environment is what that voice stands for. Um, you have models in Ohio. Um, what is called, it is actually a brick and mortar school. It's called virtual high school in um, in Ohio, but it's an alternative high school that is using all digital curriculum and allowing students to really have that personalized blended instruction we talked about. Uh, there's several other examples. I know uh, Los Angeles, the virtual academy there, is allowing um, and, and making available digital content for teachers to use blended learning and the professional development. They also offer online courses for students, so students can do both online and face-to-face -face study. So there are a number of models that are cropping up. Uh, Fairfax County in Virginia has had an online program for a number of years. So if you're interested, um, information on blended and hybrid learning, and those two terms are used interchangeably, I uh, hope that's not confusing, uh, in our promising practices guide. So we did the research, and just the last bit of research I wanted to highlight was a study from uh, the United States Department of Education that came out last year that found a meta-analysis of a number of studies. Students that took all or part of their classes online performed better than the same students taking or the same groups of students taking courses through face-to-face -face instruction. The other part of the study is very interesting is that the students who did blended learning, combining the online with the face-to-face -face elements, had a larger advantage and they did, um, they did the best in terms of student outcomes. So uh, that is great news for people moving in this direction that student engagement is key and we're seeing successful student outcomes. Um, course completion rates. Uh, across uh, the board for APEXs in all 50 states, Florida virtual schools in a number of states, including uh, with 120,000 enrollments in Florida, virtual high school partners uh, with districts in 32 different states, a high level of rigor and course completion rates. And our students learning, national average for students with a three or higher on their AP exam, you see better rates um, for the online programs nationwide. So this is all good news. The bottom line, and this is really at the crux of Governor Wise's report, is that we are entering very difficult economic times and we cannot keep doing things the way that we have always done them and keep spending money on the same things that we've always done. Um, we're not getting the results we need for our kids to be uh, technology savvy, global citizens that are connected. We need to do a better job on investments that work. And right now, online learning is a very smart investment and probably now more than ever. If I can just shift over a little bit and um, the work that I did back in 2002 to 2005 on the last National Education Technology Plan, those student demographics, who are today's students, how do they use technology inside and outside of school, uh, I thought it was really um, a really, really good base to build off of. But now, um, what I'm going to do in talking about uh, today's students is look at specific implement implications for education and some more research that has been done just in the last few years. So it's going to be a little bit of a different twist. I love, um, and anybody can have a copy of these slides. I'm sure Steve can make them available. Um, I'm happy to send them to anybody. This is from the Beloit College uh, mindset list for the students that are coming in. And um, I, I love this. These kids have never used a card catalog to find a book. The European Union has always existed. Text has always been hyper. There's always gonna, been a computer in the Oval Office. 
cable television systems have always offered telephone service and vice versa. They've always been flat screens. Everyone has always known what the evening news was before the evening news came on. And migration of once independent media like radio, TV, videos, and compact discs to the computer has never amazed them. We, we've seen this kind of data before, but the context of these students entering our education system is very different. The other thing that is very different about the demographics is that unlike any other demographic group before them, these students ha cannot be defined by traditional demographic data like birth dates. That they are actually defined better by the characteristics of their online actions. What we're finding is, and this is from Iconoculture's Nancy Robinson. She wrote um, Millennial Mindspace. Students have a global outlook at a younger age, and they're used to um, mobile multimedia being very much in a community building, socially networked environment. They expect that to live, play, and learn. That to them, um, the concept of TiVo, time shifting on demand, and customization should be part of everything that they do in life. And they're even saying, you know, traditional media like television is boring. You can't customize it. Uh, but those of you that um, go back and, and did media studies, I, I think of Marshall McLuhan's work in thinking of um, hot versus cold technologies, describing one as passive and one as interactive. These students are looking for interactive, participatory, engaging environments to live, work, and play. Not all technologies fall into that. And so when we think about in integrating technology and when we think about the future of education, uh, it's, uh, I love this quote, it's not about being anesthetized, it's about being engaged and using the internet as a creator of community. So these impl implications for education on the values that students have are around freedom and choices. And freedom and choices in school, customization and personalization. Clearly, the ability to scrutinize what they're doing and provide feedback for improvement. They want to be in an environment of integrity and openness. Want, they want lots of collaboration and what they call serious play in their education. And, and that can be defined uh, for, for those of us, project-based learning, real-life experiences and learning. The ability to move fast and accelerate with a, uh, we call it their own pacing, and they expect constant innovation. Some of these things uh, do not mark what many of us uh, see in traditional school models. So thinking about what their expectations of education are, um, this can help us. Millennials want clear guidelines, rules, and goals. They want responsiveness and fast feedback from uh, guidance counselors, from teachers, from administrators. They want this interactivity and customization, and we're learning as a community. Um, and, and that's very much like what Steve is, is building uh, for teachers and other educators, these resources, places where open, inclusive, and diverse thinking is encouraged, project-based, team-oriented learning, involvement in community, and volunteer opportunities. Well, Michael Barber asks, is this based on that how in Strauss work? Um, the work that we did on the National Ed Tech Plan uh, that was uh, published in 2005 was heavily based on that how in Strauss work. Uh, I believe these research studies are building, building on them, um, but they're going beyond them and trying to look more directly through uh, the research in how, um, how students want to be involved. So community and volunteer, and we'll get to that question unless, um, it, yeah, we've got that, a hand raised, that, that, Steve. That, that, <laughs> somebody <laughs> raised their hand. Oh, okay. I want to ask a question. I'm getting a echo, Susan. I'm getting an echo, Susan. So if you don't mind, yeah. So if you don't mind, uh, yeah, I'm going to turn your mic uh, off just for a second. I'm going to turn your mic off just for a second. But as I look at these two but slides, the student values and the millennials want. I guess the question in my mind is, 
uh, is this actually are these actually new desires or are we just at a place technologically where we can actually do this? It's a great question. I don't think they're new. Uh, I think it's new for people to research this and have it come through so clearly. Uh, I know that in the focus groups that I've been doing with kids, I try to do focus groups when I do school visits uh, and travel as much as I can. These kinds of uh, these kinds of ideas have been coming through very clearly. Uh, the f the fact that we have folks. Um, doing research and making it very clear is helpful. And uh, clearly the, the technology is what is allowing them to do these things and I think making it very clear to them, we know what's possible now, why don't you deliver on this? Um, uh, the next couple things I'm going to get to in the slides are actual recommendations for school leaders that have come out of this. Does, does that answer your question? So it did answer my question. There were a couple of questions that came through in the chat that if you don't mind, I'm going to quickly mention just because I know that we're, you, you've got a full schedule here. Leslie wanted to comment about the need for professional training in using these technologies. Um, for you, where are you seeing this done well, maybe I guess, and, and how big a deal is this? In terms of um, teachers and professional development, is that the question? Yeah, the, her question was uh, teachers needing, or her comment was that teachers need professional development training in these technologies. And someone else actually asked, do the students need training as well? So just I guess speak to the training component of online learning, and is it being done well? Yeah, and I'll add to that Michael Barber's comment here. Is it training with uh, the technology or with the pedagogy? And I'd, I'd say it's, it, somebody said both, but it's actually three things. It's the, uh, the content, uh, the technology, and the pedagogy. And, and uh, the answer to that question is that this is a real challenge. Um, when, when I get into these slides on uh, just real quickly what other countries are doing there, teacher colleges and, and uh, teacher education programs are teaching all teachers to use digital content. They're teaching all teachers to use new virtual learning environments and new platforms. And when you look at what's happening uh, and the way teachers are trained, it really hasn't changed in the United States. The, we did a, uh, we've done needs assessment surveys for online courses and services in 12 uh, states. And in all of those states, the number one need for professional development, as outlined by building administrators, principals, is technology training for uh, teachers. The teachers do not have, um, a largely do not have these skills coming in. And the fact that um, this is a real, a really something that needs to be addressed. And I propose that every single teacher in pre-service it needs to develop the skills to teach online. And what that means is they have the skills to use digital content, the technology, and the pedagogical skills to do this very different networked, collaborative, online environment. That means they can do blended or face-to-face. -face. If you look at the national uh, quality standards for online teaching, it, it really lays out those uh, pedagogical, technical, even the kinds of uh, copyright knowledge uh, that you need to know when using digital content. So um, uh, the professional development for teachers in this area tends to be something districts have to do on top of everything else. And we have got to make that a, as a systemic change. Thanks. Susan, there was one other comment when you showed the slide from Disrupting Class. Um, and it was Michael who had wondered if, um, in fact, that S-curve applied to education. Are you seeing anything that would validate the models from Christensen and, and the authors of that book? We're seeing a lot. If you think that the, the key criteria for disruptive technologies or disruptive innovations are one, um, it's filling an area of non-consumption. Um, number two, that it is um, really uh, coming into clash with, and in the case of education, this is policies. 
um, and, and sort of uh, structures that exist, and uh, Michael Barber points out at a K-12 level. Uh, there are different issues in, in higher ed and workforce training, but at a K-12 level, which is what they were addressing. And then the third big point is create the value that uh, to the marketplace didn't know that it needed necessarily, and, and I'm taking that from the perspective of students and teachers. So uh, students, teachers, um, and parents, um, our online learning programs that our members of ours are getting record numbers of applications from teachers wanting to teach online. For every open teaching position, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of applicants. So teachers clearly are interested in this. It is also offering new professional opportunities for them to telecommute or to have part-time jobs to be adjunct faculty. Uh, which is very interesting. It's, it's a shift that's happened in every other profession um, in the 21st century, and it's just starting to happen in the teaching profession, which I think is, is great news and it's exciting. Uh, back to the disrupting class, clearly uh, this is filling areas of non-consumption. That is, 40% of high schools in the U.S. did not offer AP courses. Online and virtual learning is really shifting that. 75% of school districts in the U.S. use online courses to help uh, fill those gaps and meet those needs. Um, way, the way that it's deployed really determine on whether they're coming head to head with policies, but certainly policies around funding based on seat time. Uh, versus competency based is a huge issue and we're going to really uh, take a, a leadership position on that and try to move that forward to look at new models of mastery and pathways that will be more student centered. So um, I hope that answered that question too. It did, and I'm sensitive to time, so I want you to move forward, although uh, I'll keep gathering questions and at the end if we have time we'll bring them back up again. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just so, sitting here enjoying it because I won't be able to attend your sessions next week. I'll be busy, you know, wandering around the exhibit hall, shaking hands, and going to other sessions. So I'm thrilled to be able to participate in this way. Thank you. So the recommendations we have um, a, a lot of data now from various sources on the millennials. What do we need to do? And and this is really the guidance for leaders in education, and that is within courses whether they they are blended or virtual, developing online learning communities, uh, online discussions, and creating social networking for discussion and analysis and students is something that really can help engage them in the learning. Uh, opportunities for experiential learning. We're starting to see more innovative models around this. We're allowing students to do more with internships, field experiences, uh, case method approaches. Providing uh, structure, I, I did see a comment on that. Um, uh, kids want very direct goals and objectives, but the structure in in give us give us the project, give us the outcome, let us know why we're doing it, and then they really dig deep. But providing lots of feedback, using technology, blended classes, and online learning is one of these key recommendations. Allowing uh, for the creativity, recognizing the need for social interaction, and ultra communication. That term ultra communication has come up in a number of these studies. Just the rate uh, at which these students are communicating with other people, other students, uh, using the various technologies it, it is just phenomenal. And we have to, uh, getting to number eight, Build in focus time in the instructional design of courses, uh, again, whether it's face-to-face, -face, online, or blended. Building in the reflection time and discussion time is really critical. Getting these multi-tasker structures through the course design is something uh, that we can do. So uh, I love this piece from the, every year there's a national survey for student engagement. This is done in higher education. Um, for the first time in 2008, online learners reported deeper approaches to learning on our college campuses than classroom-based learners. And the director of the study thought uh, that what they, they had to tease this out in the data. 
but that the instructors who taught classes online were making special efforts to engage their students. Uh, they were getting special training and professional development. And people who teach online classes don't take engagement for granted. They are building that in. They also found higher levels of higher order thinking skills, integrative thinking, and reflective learning from the students. So all good news for those of us in K-12 looking at these trends and trying to find ways to in improve our classrooms for the 21st century. Now Clayton Christensen um, has, this was a book that came out before Disrupting Class. There was one chapter on education that was really looking across a whole number of industries asking what are the next innovations. And he, he does this quote, using the internet to deliver courses seems to contain great disruptive potential. It could allow a radical transformation to happen in an incremental, rational way. I, I do have a number of uh, global examples that I would be happy to go into, but I wanted to see if people had any other uh, questions from anything that's been brought up before. If you wanted me to go ahead, uh, let's have some time for questions. So from Wesley, um, what is it, uh, I think you're saying, what can be a solution for teacher shortages? Uh, that's a great question and that's actually one of the big drivers for virtual learning. Um, in many school districts have uh, serious teacher shortages. I give the example across the state of Georgia. There are 440 high schools. There are in Georgia 88 licensed physics teachers teaching. When you have teacher shortages to that scale, you are not going to um, fill those by the traditional way of trying to do the incentives and getting the teachers to come in. It hasn't worked for 20 years. It's not, it's not happening now. So um, they're not replacing teachers, but in areas where they're they are, don't have teachers, what they're doing is, uh, quite simply, a new distribution model. Uh, many people call the early days of distance learning distributed learning. It's referred to often in the field as distributed learning. And what this means is you have all of these geographic locations without qualified physics teachers or other teachers. You can take a highly qualified or an, a teacher with an advanced degree who's licensed and give them the skills to teach online effectively uh, in, a, in a program, an online program to teach in, then you can change the distribution model of students in any school can access those courses. A great example of this, so Georgia actually uh, created a state virtual school to help meet that need. State of Alabama has the access program. They have online learning in every single high school now. In three years, they invested in digital curriculum, in the training to train teachers, and every single high school has access to advanced placement um, and other, other courses uh, simply through distributed learning, through distance learning, through online learning. All of those uh, course materials are made available to schools to do blended and other models too. So there are lots of questions here. Steve, if you can help yes. me out by... Um, can I shepherd a couple <laughs> to you? Okay, I'll, I'll pass a few your way. So um, uh, one question related to the inclusion of parents, and you were talking about how the pedagogies are changing. Uh, are, is there a recognition uh, that somehow comes out of the online learning of ways to include parents that hasn't been done in traditional classrooms? Yeah, that's a terrific question. And one thing that's been really interesting is because in online courses, so much of the educational materials, but also the progress, the grades, the uh, essentially electronic portfolios, they're all online, is that all of a sudden the classroom is very transparent and parents can see exactly what their students are doing. and. Um, uh, find new ways to help that student, but also uh, just stay very much up, up to date with it. The, there are a number of different models. This is especially true in full-time online programs that have a highly qualified teacher um, teaching classes, 
but use the parents as a learning coach or a support. It's almost like the model of having parents come in and volunteer in the face-to-face -face school, but having that kind of support. There are all different models um, for this. We do have a parent's guide uh, that we put out for online learning that talks about the different roles um, in different models. But I think the biggest uh, piece is uh, as our schools are looking for what we call home to school connections and getting parents more information and more engaged, online and blended learning where so much of the student work and those discussions is made available through a parent sign-in in many of the virtual schools that has been really a great way to get the parents engaged and understanding what the students are doing. Susan, Dee made a comment that made me wonder if this is um, real, actually taking place or perceived or both. She says they want to replace the teacher so they don't have to pay benefits. Is there a sense that online learning carries this kind of negative piece of its a way of cutting costs and, and diminishing the role of teachers? That's a great question and I think that's one of the biggest um, um, issues that's out there. Is this, uh, when I say online learning, I'm talking about online teaching and learning and that means that online is the delivery method and we're talking about teacher teaching teachers teaching and students learning. Um, and what I mean by that is that uh, the definition is really around web delivered courses that are taught by licensed teachers. I, I think when people um, say that you're replacing teachers, you're talking about computer based training. And if you look at um, school districts are, are not going to be awarding credit for a computer based training uh, course. I mean, you're looking at awarding credit for a highly qualified teacher and in providing instruction, providing assessment, and guiding that student and, and being available to guide that student. And again, this goes back to the uh, quality standards for online courses, for online teaching, and for online programs. And central to all three of those have to do with the activities between the teacher and the student. Okay, if I didn't get your question, please feel free to put it in the chat. I'm sorry, that's been fast moving. It's been a very exciting session with all of the comments. Feel free to put it in the chat or you can raise your hand using the hand with the green up arrow icon. It's at the bottom of your participant window to let us know you want to take the microphone. We have about seven minutes left, so this is a good time for questions. Susan, so uh, while we're waiting, um, I'm interested in the shift that I'm experiencing myself personally with regard to student-centered learning. Not that I haven't been supportive, at least with my own children, and having them kind of be self-motivated learners, but I sense that I'm becoming more comfortable with the idea of students um, being self-motivated and guiding their own learning process. Are other other people going through the same transformation as these technologies provide for that? Yeah, that's a great, great question. And what we're seeing is that it depends on the student. And, and if we really, uh, that seems very obvious. But when we have very self-directed and very motivated students, you have a lot of that. You have them really, um, dad, let me have the car keys, I'm going to go now, right? The same thing in learning. They want to be given the tools, they want to be able to drive some of their own learning and quite frankly that's a, that's a, good, that's a good thing um, as long as they're being access, assessed and given that feedback. Uh, students that struggle, there are lots of kids that struggle that may not have the uh, foundational um, learning and knowledge that they need and those are very different student support models when we start talking about blended and online learning environment. Those can involve um, much more uh, tutoring. They can involve much more access, whether it's online tutoring or face-to-face -face tutoring, different kinds of mentoring models. And um, 
Well, oh, Michael Barber's uh, here. He's been involved in the INACL Research Committee. They've put out a brief on different mentoring and facilitation models that happen. Um, and he's getting ready to uh, publish a, a report that is actually an issues brief that has been a survey of different programs working with credit recovery and at-risk students that I think is extremely helpful. So. Um, and this idea that the technology is allowing for students to drive their own learning is certainly is certainly true. And providing the kinds of platforms and delivery systems that that really help students accelerate their learning um, is something that we uh, are just getting started at as a field, and we're seeing more of those models uh, come forward. Susan, we have about four minutes left. Was there anything you wanted specifically to get to in the slides before we close? Well, I can, uh, we don't have to go through the slides themselves, but a quick around the world. Some of you have heard me um, do this, but there's some really interesting things uh, happening. And one is, I often comment that, you know, more than five years ago, Mexico had already digitized their entire content curriculum. They are now training all of their teachers and their colleges of education and pre-service programs in how to use digital teaching and teach online. They have a whiteboard in every classroom. They give a laptop to every teacher. They've been doing this for a while. Uh, as we look overseas, we're seeing some really major changes happening both in developing nations and developed nations. The International Baccalaureate Program that many of you may work with has digitized and, and made uh, online courses for each of the IB courses. They now have an entire IB diploma program online. They're working across 125 different countries. So students enrolled in that program may be interacting with students from other countries, uh, practicing their language skills, sharing ideas, collaborating, discussing. And we think of learning in a global context. You ask, do students in your school, do students in your district have access to those kinds of learning opportunities? Our overall goal is to say, does every student in the United States and internationally have access to a world-class education. And using today's technologies, that is possible. So when we're looking at the future of education, we're seeing some big trends in online and blended learning, lots of disruptive technologies to connect and collaborate. And I'm thrilled in joining all of you in the great work that you're doing. And uh, we've done a number of international surveys, uh, and those are online on our website. If any of you have suggestions or models or examples of best practices you'd like to share, um, please uh, let us know. And we look forward to collaborating and connecting with you. I'm grateful to be here, and thanks so much, Steve. Susan, that's just been wonderful. I don't like to compare uh, guests who come on the show because they're different days and different times, but you did beat Clay Shirky. You had over 100 people uh, attending today in the middle of the day, so that says a lot for the material you're providing. I'm clapping. Uh, really appreciate uh, your being here. You can uh, download the slide deck from today's show by going up now to File, Save, and Save the Whiteboard. It typically helps to save it in PDF format. Mike, I want to give you a chance to give a final plug for Susan being at Q and for the Q conference. Absolutely. Thanks, Steve. And, and I apologize for my silence, but uh, it's, uh, it's the highest compliment I could give, Susan. Um, it's really exciting to see the information you've got uh, shared, the data that you can share. Uh, oftentimes in educational technology, we're referred to as being sort of gadget focused and excited about technologies without having data to back it up. And you, thankfully, buck that trend quite, quite well. And it's, it's always good to see that you've got the, the rock solid data to back up what you're talking about. And it's not just uh, blue sky theory. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you there next week in Palm Springs. Uh, and I also want to mention that uh, we've got an online teaching conference that Q is partnering with the California Educational Technology Collaborative on in June. And Allison Powell, the VP of INACL, is going to be there to open it up at the opening keynote. And she'll invite some students up on stage to talk about their experiences in online learning. So thanks again for the opportunity. I hope that uh, you guys can check it out. The info I'll put in the chat window about that last conference. And uh, hopefully you guys can join us either virtually or in person in Palm Springs. 
Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thanks, Susan. Wonderful. Can't wait to actually meet you in person uh, this coming week. Uh, we'll sign off now. We'll turn off the recording. And please just feel free to exit the room. There is a survey that you can answer when you leave. Uh, thanks for coming today.